friends, how's it going? This is going to be a very, very laid back video, which I've decided to put into three kind of parts because I'm going to be trying to combine a lot of things in this video together. And it might be a little bit confusing, but I'm going to put timestamps down, time stamps down below for everything. So if you want to bounce around, if you're only here for a certain part of the video, feel free to do that. But the way that this video is going to go, the overarching theme of this is Climathon. If you don't know, if you haven't seen my announcement video or my friend Tasman's announcement video, this year we are hosting a year long Climathon reading challenge where we are trying to encourage people to read more about the planet, about the environment, about the climate crisis. I will leave links down below where you can learn more about the Climathon, but essentially there are 12 different prompts that you can follow. I'm kind of going to be doing it one prompt per month for the entire year, but you can do it however you see fit. And so within these 12 prompts, I'm going to be giving you one book that I recommend that I have read in the past that I think would be good fit for the prompt, as well as what I'm planning to put on my TBR for that prompt. There are a couple prompts where I do not have something specific to recommend or on my TBR, but I will talk about that more when I get there. While I'm telling you all of that, I'm also going to be repotting a bunch of stuff. So there's two kind of categories of things I want to be repotting. I've done a few videos like this before where I've, you know, repotted things in my home and then talked about different like nature books. And that's what I'm going to be doing today. So the first part of this video, I'm going to be talking to you about kind of the house plants that I'm going to be repotting. Then as I repot them, I'm going to be giving you my recommendations and my TBRs for the climathon. And then at the very end, I'm going to have some seeding of more like vegetable things and just kind of probably blabber on and on about vegetables and seeds and growing your own food, which I think is something that's very important if people have the means to do so within the current climate that we are living in. There will be timestamps down below, so if you want to skip this part where I just kind of show you my plans and gush about growing things, then you can click down below and go straight to where I will be giving you my recommendations and my TBR. Otherwise, let's talk about kind of what is all around me. There's like a complete mess all around me. It's fine, it's fine. First thing I wanted to show you guys, if you watched, I think about a year ago, I put out two or three videos where I repotted things and was like trying to grow different things from seed, etc., etc. I will link above in the cards the video where I first showed you guys this plant. If anyone remembers, I don't know if anyone pays that much attention, but I was trying to grow a date tree from a date seed, just like a date that I had bought at the store. I spread out a bunch of date seeds. I think I planted like three or four of them in the soil. All of them died except for this one. And this is, I don't know if you can see it very well, but this thing has gone out of control. Like the roots are coming out at the bottom. It's kind of a little bit difficult to show you guys, but look, sorry, there's rocks on top. Uh, the roots are coming out of the bottom. I really need to repot this and I was planning on repotting it in this video, but somehow when I was thinking about what pots I needed, I thought I had a pot for this and I don't have a pot for this. So I can't repot this in this video, but I just wanted to show you guys like how big it has gotten. And I'm very, very excited for it. I am gonna try to repot it this week so we can have a little bit more breathing space because it's definitely suffocating in this little guy. Then let me show you the plants that I'm actually going to be repotting in this video. We have this guy, which I have also grown from seed. This is an avocado seed tree that I started to sprout over the summertime this past summer. I was living in Valencia and I bought an avocado there and I sprouted it. And then just recently I put it into this. It's like a uh, what is it called like a yogurt container because i needed to transport it but now i'm going to put it into an actual container i think into this action i'm going to repot it into here so it has a little bit more space uh, then we have this which is just like a plain house plant but i am obsessed with it i don't even know what it's called actually and this is the wrong box i've already repotted i don't know what this is called i think it is so cool it kind of looks like it's dying like the leaves are at this like pinky type of color but this is what it's supposed to look like and i just think it's such a fun and unique plant and I think I'm going to pot it into this maybe. Does that make sense? Should I pot it into this guy? I think I'll pot it into this. Yeah, that looks good. And then I also have this, which looks like it's dying because it is dying a little bit, but there are actually two plants in here. This first one, the big one here that it looks like it's falling apart is a chrysanthemum. I bought this when I was in Poland. It was essentially like the price of like 25 cents because it was on clearance because it was dying. But this flower was still blooming really nicely. And I was like, ah, for 25 cents, like I'll buy it. I'll have it for you know, a month before it falls apart and dies and then I'll compost it. However, before I was leaving Poland, it actually started to sprout new leaves, like new growth at the bottom here. And I was like, oh, it's still alive. It is still thriving. Like I must take it with me, which is ridiculous. So I, I, <laughs> I brought this like dying chrysanthemum with me and I'm gonna repot it now so it can like hopefully continue to live because I do know that they can continue to live. It just needs some like love and care. And then the side here, I don't know if you can even see it, but right there at the bottom, there's a little baby uh, Pilia peperomitis, I believe that they're called. And I had bought one of these plants when I was living in Poland. And one of my favorite things to do is to buy plants 
propagate them and give them off to friends. And so I had bought a bigger like Pilia peperomitis and it had two little babies. And so I gave the big mom to one of my friends and then I gave the other little baby actually to Tasman, who is the creator of the Climathon. So I think that is perfect. And then I have this one little baby left. So I need to repot this little baby and also this chrysanthemum, you know, separate them so they both have their space. I bought a couple of these little ceramic planters. All the rest of these planters are things that have been either bought secondhand or they're being reused, but I ran out of planters. So the chrysanthemum I'm going to put into this pot and then the little pilia peperomitis I'm going to put into this little terracotta pot. And then the last thing that's going into a terracotta pot is this plant as well. I've never seen something like this before, which is why I bought it. And this is called a Syngodium Neon Robusta, apparently. And I love it. It has like red leaves underneath. And I'm going to be putting that into another little terracotta pot. Okay, let me organize a little bit here so that there's a little bit of visual so you can see a little bit of what I'm doing. I don't know how well you'll be able to see. When I do plant all of the vegetable seeds and stuff, I will bring you up a little bit closer. You will also notice that I'm using just a regular spoon. This is literally just like a spoon from the kitchen. I'm a big believer in not buying things that you don't need, especially if you're planning on buying something new really think about if you actually need that item so where i am right now this is my parents house and they do have a like a balcony and a patio where there are some plants and that kind of stuff and we do you know grow some things and there is like repotting that happens but it's not on a large enough scale where it makes sense for us to actually buy like potting tools right I, I hope i hope in the near future for me it will make sense when i have potentially a bit more access to land and that kind of stuff but for now it doesn't make any sense and so I just use this little spoon. It is a little bit more inconvenient, especially when you're repotting something a bit bigger, but for the most part, it's completely fine. So yeah, I'm gonna be using this to repot. And I'm also not using any fancy soil. I don't really have access to like good soil or anything like that right now. So this is just like plain potting mix. Uh, it would be nice to have something a little bit better, but it is what it is. I'm just trying to open it up a little bit more before I start. Uh, giving you guys my recommendations. All right, let's get started. This is going to be a complete mess. I do apologize. So first off, the first prompt is read a book about plants. So my recommendation for this is actually going to be Around the World in 80 Plants. This is a book that I finished at the end of last year, and it is a book that goes and talks about 80 different plants from around the world, and it has incredible illustrations. So not only are you supporting you know, someone who has a lot of knowledge about plants, but you're also supporting an actual artist who is making these beautiful drawings. And I love that book. If you are someone who is like just in general, overall interested about plants, I think it is such a good resource because it talks a lot about different plants that you may have heard of, you may have not heard of. I think I know, knew most of the plants that were in that book. There was maybe like five or six that were brand new to me, but it just has these like fun little quick tidbits about these plants. And it was just like such an exciting book to read. And it's also gorgeous. It is like this beautiful, thing that I just like I know I'm gonna have for the rest of my life and like come back to it and it's just it's such a treasure in my life now so definitely my recommendation is around the world in 80 plants and the book that I'm going to be reading is on my TBR so I have my my list here on my laptop because there's definitely not enough stuff all around me on my TBR I've actually chosen the book Botanicum and I have seen this in bookstores multiple times and it kind of reminds me of the Around the World in 80 Plants book except it feels like it's a little bit more of a coffee table book. Oh, look at those roots. Hello. This guy needed a new place for sure. Yeah, it reminds me of this Around the World in 80 Plants book except a little bit more of a coffee table book. And it does feel like it's a little bit more scientific from what I've, when I've like flipped through it in person. I don't actually have a physical copy of it, but I would like to get a physical copy of it. I brought out some of these books to hold up and show you as I was recommending them, but I realized that's just not going to happen because my hands are going to be covered in dirt this entire time. So I'm just going to um, read off of my laptop and tell you what I've got there. So next up, the next prompt is read a book about animals or fungi. My recommendation for this is Silent Earth. This is also a book that I read in this past year, and it is about insects and how insects are dying out. <laughs> There's a lot of different reasons why insects are potentially dying out. There's not really like one specific reason, and it also, of course, like depends on the insect. There's also insects that are increasing in numbers, which is also like setting the balance of nature and of the different like biospheres and stuff that they live in off of balance, which is not great. I really like this book because I think insects are something that can often be overlooked, except for bees. I feel like bees have a lot of good publicity in terms of like we need to save the bees and bees are important and we kind of understand that bees are important obviously because you know they help pollinate our food and they're extremely important in that way. Although a lot of other insects also pollinate our food, it's not just bees that do that. 
but insects I feel like can be a little bit overlooked and there's something that he talks about in this book too but that I've seen pop up a lot is that when we were younger, I say we as like millennials, when we were younger and you would go on a road trip or you would you know, drive down to the lake or something and your front bumper would be covered in insects and that doesn't happen anymore. And like, I have this very vivid image of my friend when I was younger, we like, you know, got our driver's license, whatever, and she bought a car. And it was the first time we had kind of gone out in this car and we went down to this lake by her house. And I remember coming, it was like, a, I don't know if the car was brand new, I don't actually remember, but it was like, you know, brand new shiny type of like, fresh off the lot kind of thing. It might've been used, but like it was very clean and like shiny and sparkly for her. And I remember we came back from this lake on like kind of our first trip after she got this car and her car was disgusting. It was so covered in bugs. It was just like completely plastered at the front. And I don't feel like that happens anymore. There's just like such a loss of insects. Something he also talks about in regards to that is that now when kids are growing up, they're not used to seeing all of these insects. So they're kind of used to there being less insects. And so they don't see that drastic change of what it used to be like. And I really like the way the book was structured because it would have this sort of like dense chapter that was more scientific and talked a lot more about like a specific reason why uh, insects might be dying out, et cetera, et cetera. And then it would have like one page of just like fun facts about a, a random insect. And some of them were like kind of disgusting facts. Some of them were like sexual facts. Some of them were funny facts, but it kind of like broke up more of that scientific jargon and with like these like fun little anecdotes, I guess, about different insects. It's a very like nice and accessible book. And then for me, my TDR for reading a book about animals or fungi, I have decided on Entangled Life, how fungi make our worlds, change our minds and shape our futures. I'm not someone who's super into animals. I don't really know why. I don't know what the, the process is behind that, but I like the insect book, but I decided to go for more mushroom books. This one, yeah, talks about mushrooms and fungi. And I'm very excited about it because I think the, the way that, you know, like mycelium and stuff is all connected is super fascinating to me and I would love to learn more about it. This is also quite a popular book. So if you have read it, please let me know down below. I have very high hopes for it. And I also think it's a gorgeous book. Next up, we have read a book about consumerism slash capitalism. For this, I'm choosing Cultish. And the reason I'm choosing this is because I think that, you know, consumer capitalism is not something great <laughs> in the way that it is formed in our kind of like current world mm. and what i really liked about the book cultish is that it goes through these different sort of like more religious cults at first right so it talks about you know different religious cults where there's like one leader and then you know everyone's all of a sudden in a forest and they're poisoning themselves because they believe in this guy or whatever and you, you read it and you're like oh yeah like i would never fall for that type of thing but then it kind of transitions into cults in more of our like everyday world in the sense that you know there is a lot of cult mentality in our consumer choices, right? So if you're someone who like does Pilates or if you use Apple products or whatever, right? These are all kind of like types of cults. And the author really goes in depth in like a very easy understood way, talking about how we all kind of belong to these cults, right? And something that this book touches upon and which I think is like something that's very important for me at least to step away from is the fact that how we dress, what we buy, the sort of like consumer choices that we make do not define who we are. Something that's very prevalent in sort of like the booktube community is that if you have a wall full of books, that makes you a reader. But if you don't, like, are you really a reader if you don't own hundreds of books? I mean, of course you are. <laughs> There's so many other ways to read, right? But if we're talking about climate and how our consumer choices have an impact on the climate, something I'm trying to get a lot better at is sort of stepping back and saying, you know, who I am as a person and my core values and my morals and my beliefs are not defined by my purchases, right? Like I don't need to buy things to prove that I'm a specific type of person, if that makes sense. And so I think this book kind of makes you reframe and rethink about your consumer choices and sort of like the cults that you fall into and whether or not you are just buying things to sort of like show the world who you are versus actually just showing the world who you are. I don't know if that explanation made a lot of sense, but I would really recommend this book. And the one that I'm going to be reading for consumerism slash capitalism is Consumed by Aja Barber. This book came out, I think in 2021, I believe, and it's about fast fashion. It's one that's been on my TBR for a very long time. Fast fashion is something that I have been trying to avoid for many, many years now. And it's something that I always like to learn more about just for my own sake and then also to like, kind of help to educate and teach other people about it as well. And I've only heard good things about this book. The next prompt is read a book about the ocean, water, islands, ice, etc. And for this one, I actually don't have a recommendation because <laughs> I was thinking about this. It's kind of strange because I love water. I love living near the water. I love being near the water. I'm definitely a beach bum. Like when it's summertime, I just want to be on the sand in the water swimming 
all of that kind of stuff. But I don't really like reading about the water, reading about water, reading about ice, reading about islands, even reading about animals that live in the water and in the oceans is not something that really interests me. And so over the course of a couple different climathons, I have read some books that have to do with water, but I have not actually really fully enjoyed any of them. And so I don't want to recommend a book that I just like partially liked. So I will direct you uh, back to Storygraph. We have a Storygraph uh, challenge that we have put together. Tazan and I and other people as well have put together different recommendations for these prompts. Whoa, everything's falling apart. <laughs> so I would recommend going to that Storygraph account or that Storygraph challenge if you have the need to have a recommendation for this prompt because I just don't want to give you a prompt just to give you a prompt. But there's tons of other books in there that people have recommended and added for this prompt that I would say you should go check out if you're looking for something. But I will tell you what I'm planning on reading for this prompt, and it's going to be The Soul of an Octopus. Now, the reason I'm choosing this is because I just recently got interested in octopuses, octopi, because I was reading this book, 60 Harvest Left, which talks about how if we continue doing agriculture the way we've been doing agriculture, we only have 60 harvests left. And within that, there was quite a lot of talk about fish farming and specifically like octopus farming and how octopus farming is really difficult because octopuses are just so smart and so sentient that they will like break out of their cage, which to me is just wild, but also like makes a lot of sense. And so I'm riding this little high of being interested in octopuses. And because of that, I'm going to read this book and hope that I enjoy it. But yeah, we'll see, we'll see. Like I said, I don't know what it is. I love being near the water, on the water, but I don't really like reading about it for whatever reason. It's getting messy. Okay, next up, a book about connection. My recommendation for this is to do with trees and their connections to each other, and that is The Hidden Life of Trees by a German author whose name I'm not going to try to pronounce because I know Tasman will laugh at me, but this book talks so much about the connectedness of trees underneath the earth. So the trees have their roots, and all of these roots have ways of communicating with each other. And for example, like if one tree gets sick from some sort of like parasite, it's able to send out a message into the roots of other trees and those other trees can try to like protect themselves. You know, they can put out an enzyme or something into their leaves or into their sap or whatever it is that will like try to protect them if that disease or that pest comes to them. And so this, this like hidden world of how trees communicate is so cool to me. I know we have like fantasy books, <laughs> but if you just like read about how nature works, that to me is magic. Like nature is just such magic. And so the connection of trees, yes. And the one that I am going to be reading for this is Kiss the Ground. I have quite a few books on this list actually that are more to do with like agriculture and farming. And this is one of those where it talks a lot about soil health and regenerative agriculture. And for me, this sort of like connection to the earth and like getting your hands into the dirt, which I talk about all the time. I think we should all do a little bit more of. And so the way that I'm interpreting this is the connection of me and the soil and sort of like how I can better take care of it and so because of that I'm going to read Kiss the Ground. Next up we have read a book by an indigenous author. My recommendation for this is Fresh Banana Leaves. I read this for the last climathon I think and this is an indigenous author who is from South America which I thought was interesting because I feel as though a lot of the books that we tend to read from indigenous authors tend to be from North America like very like America and Canada based because that's kind of what's represented in the western world in a lot of ways but this author is from South America and Something that I really enjoyed this conversation that she had because she is a doctor, um, like well, she has a, a, a doctorate as well. And she talked a lot about being in sort of like Western academia and having this indigenous knowledge, which does not translate to Western academia. And so a lot of people would kind of not take the knowledge that she had grown up with, which obviously is very, very valid and like works, right? <laughs> just because there isn't like a peer reviewed article about something does not mean that something's not true. It's just like a different way of looking at things, I suppose. And so there was a lot of discussion about this, about her and her peers and how her peers would treat her when she would try to, you know, talk more about like indigenous knowledge and how it wasn't taken seriously in Western academia. But then, you know, once something was proven, then all of a sudden, you know, someone else had come up with it and she's like, no guys, like, <laughs> you know, we've known about this for centuries. This is how we've been taking care of the land for centuries. And just now you're taking it seriously. And you're also taking credit from me for something that I like brought to your attention. Oh, this guy is, <laughs> he's not having a good time, but it's okay. I mean, he lived a lot longer than I think he would have if he had stayed at the grocery store 
So we'll see, maybe he'll bounce back and he'll be okay. I hope, fingers crossed. And the book that I'm going to be reading for uh, read a book by an indigenous author is Life in the City of Dirty Water. I have it right there on that pile of books that I don't wanna to touch because my fingers are covered in dirt, which I mean, I don't mind, but I don't know if the books will mind. Yeah, Life in the City of Dirty Water. This is written by indigenous man from Canada, from Turtle Island. And he talks a lot about essentially like water rights for indigenous peoples in Canada specifically. Apparently he's like a really big activist in Canada and trying to get clean drinking water to different areas where indigenous people live because there is, hmm, even though we don't discuss this in the media as much, a lot of like racism towards indigenous people. And there's a lot of places in Canada that do not have access to clean drinking water, which is wild to me. And so he is a really big activist within that and trying to, you know, get access to everyone essentially to have kind of what should be seen as a basic human right at this point because we have the ability for it to be accessible to everybody but anyways that is the book that i will be reading then read a book about change slash revolution my recommendation for this is going to be one that is more gentle because i feel as if for me when i think of like change and revolution i get fire in me a little bit like for me it's like more of like an aggressive thing but i wanted to recommend a book that i did read also for climate one, I believe, and it's very gentle. And that is The Book of Hope by Jean Goodall. Jean Goodall, I mean, <laughs> this also works for, you know, like the activist prompt, a lot of these books work for a lot of the prompts, but this book is genuinely so full of hope. And it is Jean Goodall just talking about the different changes that she has made, the different changes that she has seen on like the planet and like the political landscape and the different things that she has worked in and then also how much hope she still has for the future, which I think is important because it can be a lot of doom and gloom and I definitely fall victim to that as well, but she is so hopeful. And I would actually really recommend listening to this book on audio because she narrates, there's a, the guy that uh, wrote the book that like, kind of put it together. He talks throughout it and then interviews her as well. And it was written like during the pandemic. So they, I think they were going through like Skype calls or something like that. And you get to hear her narrate like her parts of the story when she's answering the questions. And just her voice and her calmness, I think is, is so nice and so good. And yeah, I would just, I would highly recommend the audiobook. I would recommend the book in general, but the audiobook I think is absolutely stunning. Y'all, I love this plant. I think this plant is so cool. Holy heck -rooney. And the book that I'm going to be adding to my TBR yet again, I think this has been on my TBR for every single climathon I've ever participated in and I've yet to read it. And that is Revolutionary Power. This is a book that Biblio Wool, who doesn't make videos right now, miss you girl but she recommended this book a long long time ago like probably two years ago on her channel and it's been on my list of things that i really want to read ever since then and this is a book based in america that talks about the different types of power sources that we can be using outside of like oil essentially <laughs> i believe maybe it's just about wind power but i don't think so i think it's about all types of like more sustainable and renewable resources and energy which as much as I believe that, you know, we should be trying to use less energy as a whole, I'm also aware of the fact that that's not going to happen overnight. And I would like to be more informed on more renewable types of energy. So I finally just need to get down and read this book. If anybody would like to buddy read this book with me, please let me know because I need to be held accountable for reading this book finally. Next up, Book by an Activist. It's Not That Radical by Michaela Loach is my recommendation. I adored this book. Michaela Loach, if you don't follow her on Instagram, I will link her down below because I would highly recommend you follow her on Instagram. She is a climate activist and she wrote this book, I believe it was released last year, and I adored it because it is so easy to read in the sense that she puts everything together so well. It really shows the interconnectedness of a lot of different types of oppressions around the world that are not that don't necessarily seem just like climate specific but that all relate somehow back to the climate crisis and like how we treat different people and how that has to do with like environmental justice and such it is more in depth than like an instagram post i've read some other things that are by people who are you know like more famous online and stuff like that and sometimes i feel like when people that that are kind of like instagram famous in a way when they put out a book it tends to be like more of what they post on their Instagram, which I think is fine. If you're looking for like a more um, base knowledge of certain things, I think that's okay. But when I buy a book, I want it to get a little bit deeper. And she made it accessible in the way that like an Instagram post is accessible or like, you know, a little meme or like a, what is it called? Carousel, I guess, post is, but just connecting things in such an easy way to understand. Also, the book is gorgeous. I have it up here because I'm not gonna touch it. I have it with me here. 
it's gorgeous it's so well done i would highly highly recommend this probably to everybody out there and the book that i'm going to be reading by an activist is no logo by naomi klein this is a book i've had on my shelf for a long time it's actually a book that kind of like changed my life because i think i was in grade six when this book came out and it's definitely not a book that I think a sixth grader would understand, but I remember my sixth grade teacher was reading it and I thought it looked really cool because it's just like this black book and it has the words no logo on it. Very fitting. And it, <laughs> I remember like going up to my teacher and being like, oh, like, can I read this book? And instead of, you know, telling me you're too young, you're not going to understand this. He was like, yeah, sure. Like when I finish reading it, you can borrow it and you can read it. And he gave it to me. I think I read like three pages and I was like, yeah, I have no clue what's going on right now because obviously I was like, you know, 10 or 11 years old, but he had faith in me. Like he didn't stop me. He was just like, yeah, sure. Like read it. Right. And of course it's not like inappropriate content or anything for a child. It's just like well out of the things that I was aware of at that time, but I will never forget that Mr. Kirkland. I know you're not watching this, but like that moment really, it solidified my confidence in reading. Let's put it that way. But I've wanted to read this book ever since then. I'm definitely past grade six and I need to get around to it. Okay, I think I've repotted all of my house plants. So let me just quickly go through the rest of it <laughs> because I do know how to ramble. That's for sure. Read a book about food. My recommendation for this is We Are the Weather by Jonathan, Jonathan Saffron Fowler, I believe. This is a book that talks about how our food choices affect the climate, which I think can be made to kind of sound like it's like a book about veganism. And in a way it is a book about veganism, but it's definitely not like you need to go vegan. I think it's more of a book that talks about reductionary measures and how we can reduce our intake of like meat, dairy, eggs, and all of that in order to have an impact on the climate because I don't think it's feasible to just be like, the world should go vegan overnight, which would be cool in some ways, I think, but I don't think it's uh, a thing that we can really ask of a lot of people. And I think the way that he writes this book seems very accessible and like not judgmental, I would say, and also something that I believe most people could get something out of it. And the book that I'm going to be reading, which you know what, I'm actually going to touch because I just really wanna show you guys this book. The book for me, a book about food, this is going to be The First Time Gardener Growing Vegetables by Jessica Sowers of Roots and Refuge Farm. I bought this book recently because Jessica, who has a YouTube channel, whose channel I will link down below, she's one of my favorite people on here, like on this platform to watch. I just love, I love her videos. I love her mentality. I love the way she presents things, just like her calm, nature her non-judgmental nature i think she's such a cool person i bought this recently not because i'm necessarily a first-time gardener i've been I, i'm not an expert i'm not saying i'm an expert but i have been like growing food for most of my life but i really wanted this i wanted to support her i wanted to have some physical knowledge in my hands she actually put out a video recently talking about ai writing books especially books that are reference books and how there can be lots of mistakes and that kind of stuff and i was like you know what she's right i need some like physical copy reference books so i bought this and i actually started reading like the first couple pages thinking it would be you know more of like a reference guide but it has that feel of jessica and how just the way she presents information i think is so beautiful and so i i know that i'm going to read this as an actual book as well as you know hopefully gain some knowledge from it as well but this is going to be my book about food just a few more we have read a book about the earth my recommendation for this is going to be leave only footprints this i think is a little bit off kelter but this is a book written by a guy who went through all of the national parks in america and i was blown away by this book i thought this was going to be him kind of lamenting the loss of his fiance no she didn't die but she broke up with him before their wedding so I thought it was going to be a little bit of like a heartbreak thing, but then also, you know, like finding himself on the trails, et cetera, et cetera. And there was like a smidgen of that, but it was mostly him going into different national parks and telling the history of these national parks, telling about the different people that live and work in these national parks and the different issues these national parks are facing. There was tons of talk about the environment and the climate crisis and how different areas of America. And the thing about America too, right? It's such a large country and there's such different ecosystems all around it. It's very much not, you know, one type of like it's not like all a rainforest or all a desert there's different types of ecosystems all around america and so we go around to all these different national parks that are all struggling in different ways and different animals are going extinct or like different plants or there's different invasive species or whatever and he writes it with such care and such awareness as well i loved i absolutely like, adored 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 i can't i can't even speak i'm so excited i love this book so much a book about earth and that care of earth i guess and all of, like all the parts of it right because some parts of it were talking about like different lakes or different mountains or trees or soil or whatever it had all of these different parts of the earth and 
I loved it. I cannot recommend this book enough. The book that I'm going to be reading for my TBR for a book about Earth is Why Women Grow. I don't have this quite yet. I have pre-ordered it. I believe that it comes out in March, but there is a podcast that I've listened to all of the episodes of and I've cried in almost every single one of these episodes. You know, I'm, I'm a bit of an emotional girly over here, but this is a book where this woman she talks about and like interviews different women and why they grow food, why they grow flowers, why they've decided to go into agriculture or into farming. And for me, that is like something that I feel very strongly about and that, you know, fingers crossed, I'm getting closer and closer to every single day. This is the book that I'm gonna be reading for a book about earth. And I'm very excited for it, but I have to wait until March when it comes out. Cause I think the hardback came out last year, but I ordered the paperback. The one prompt that I don't have any recommendations for is read a book from a different continent. I didn't do recommendations for this or put anything on my TBR because everyone comes from a different continent. I currently live in Europe, so anything outside of Europe I could consider for this prompt. There is such a vast array of different books you could obviously read for this. So I'm not doing a recommendation or putting anything on my TBR for now. By the time I get to the end of the year, I'll put something in there, but for now, both of those remain empty. And the last prompt is read a cli-fi or positive sci-fi. My recommendation for this is Drive by Neil and Jared Schusterman. This is a book, <laughs> that has stuck with me so hard. It is a book where I believe it's based in California and the water goes out essentially like the taps get turned off, they run out of water and you follow four or five different teenagers as they all try to go on this like mission to get water for their families and they all come from very different backgrounds. Some of them are just like living their regular lives. One of them was like a prepper family. The book takes place over the course of like three or four days and you watch as just chaos unravels when this thing that people need, right? This this tap water that we all depend on. Once it gets turned off, everything just goes haywire. And yeah, <laughs> it's definitely, you know, climate fiction, but it is something that I feel like is coming closer and closer to every single day. Highly recommend this book. It is very fast paced too. It's, it was long. I listened to it on audio and I think it's like 13 or 14 hours and I just raced through it. I wasn't listening to it, you know, on two times speed or anything. I was just, I could not get enough of it. It's so fast paced. It is a thriller. It's intense, wow. But my TBR pick for this is going to be something that is hopefully a little bit less intense and that is going to be A Song for the Wild Built. And the second one in this series is like the Monk and the Robot series, which I have only heard good things about this. And people kind of compare this to like solar punk, this sort of, you know, future where hopefully we use the good of technology and the good of nature and combine those two things together to have a better planet for you know, the nature, but also for people. So my TBR for this is A Song for the Wild Build as well as the other one, which I don't remember the name of, so I'm not gonna tell it to you, but yeah, both of those books are my pick for this one. Okay, that being done, this video is way too long. I've repotted all of my sort of like house plants and things that go into pots and that are not seeds, and I have given you all of my recommendations and my TBR for the Climathon. Now I'm gonna move things around a little bit and then I'm going to talk to you about some seeds, plant some seeds with you, and then we're gonna be done. I promise this video is gonna be like 40 minutes long, but it's fine. I mean, I at least find this very interesting. These are like my biggest passions in life. I'm surrounded by plants and seeds and books. I also have a coffee and a tea here, so <laughs> I don't think I could get happier right now. Okay, we're at a new angle. I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about seeds and then I'm going to plant a couple of seeds while I talk to you about them. I just wanna show you guys, I have a bit of a collection of seeds here. There are some seeds that I have saved myself. I've been trying to get better at learning how to seed save. So I have a couple seeds actually here. Let me show you the ones that I've seed saved myself. Oh my goodness, I've already, this is my mind. And here I have two different types of tomatoes. These are actually, this is not ideal, I don't think, but these are like, you know, when you order sushi and you get little soy sauce packets like this, which are, I mean, pretty wasteful, but I cleaned out two of them, dried them out really well, and I put my seeds into them because I figured they would be safe in here. So there's uh, Malina tomatoes, which are a type of, I think they're Polish types of tomatoes. It translates to like raspberry tomatoes, essentially. And then also just like a random red potato variety that I bought. So I saved both of those tomato seeds. And then in here we have lettuce seeds. I actually saved these in some vlog I did. I forget for what book. And I have grown these in the past and the lettuce did grow from them, which is pretty exciting. So I have some lettuce seeds that I have saved, some tomato seeds I've saved. And then I just have a whole bunch of like random seed packets. I have a whole pile of seeds here from a friend as well. Some of them labeled, some of them not labeled. <laughs> so I kind of plant them randomly and hope something sprouts out of them. The ones that I'm not really sure about. But in this, so I have a couple containers here. Let's talk about what I'm planning on doing. This is like a long container. The other ones, uh, my parents have three more of these and I think they're full of radishes and cilantro, I believe. But in here, what I'm planning on doing is actually planting peas. I'm gonna do one row of peas because peas don't like when it's really, really hot. 
and here in Spain right now over the winter time it's not too too hot in the summer it's way too hot for these to grow so I'm going to plant one row of peas and then I'm also going to plant one row of Paris market carrots these are some sort of like fancy carrots but they were on clearance at the end of the season last year or two years ago and what's cool about these is that these are made for planters so a lot of times carrots are a lot bigger like you know they can grow to be like this big whatever but I guess there's like this whole range of sort of like Paris or like Parisian types of vegetables different breeds that they've done that grow a lot smaller so these ones they grow fatter and they grow smaller so they're maybe like this big when you actually pull them and they grow quite well so I'm going to do one row of carrots and then one row of peas I've already lost my peas where are they right here I it depends how I'm growing things <laughs> but sometimes I will water the soil first sometimes I won't water the soil first I'm going to put in a little bit of water and then a little bit of the new soil on top and then plant the seeds I did plant them a little bit closer than I normally would because both of these seeds are older. Um, I think they're both like two or three years old at this point, which doesn't mean that they're, you know, bad or like they've gone bad or anything like that. It's not like an expiration date when you have a seed packet. It just means that the germination rate is going to be a little bit less successful, most likely. So instead of, you know, I don't know, four out of every five seeds sprouting, it might be three out of every five or something like that. first soil pot type of thing done then I think I'm going to plant some tomatoes perhaps I don't have that many pots I might start these guys in like little pots here or maybe I'll do like this little guy here these two pots will be tomatoes I don't think I'm going to use those yeah I'm going to do just like two tomatoes in here and then in here I'm going to plant sorrel so I sorrel's not very popular I don't think in Canada or in America we had it in the garden actually this is what it looks like Straf, it's called in Polish and it's sort of like a like a green that you can add to salads and stuff like that but it's a little bit sour and what's really cool about this is that it grows back every year so in Canada my parents they have like a little backyard garden and they had sorrel growing in a corner of it just like straight in the dirt and they would cut it every single summer We'd cut up cut a bunch of it add it to salads add it to whatever and it would just grow back every single year we didn't take care of it at all I think we had it for like five or six years and finally we left whatever we moved but it's something that comes back constantly which I really like and it's it's very very low maintenance I don't know how it's going to do in Spain never grown it here in Spain before but I'm going to plant it in here I do think this is a bit of a small pot for it but for now it'll do so I'm going to plant that in here and then in here put in two different tomatoes which are <laughs> I think a little bit too small for now but they'll be okay until they get a little bigger and then we can repot them This is extremely messy. This is definitely not something I normally do indoors. I would be doing this outside. It's just that, I don't know, I guess I wanted to talk to a camera while I did it today uh, to share a little bit of these things. But okay, we have our three pots here. One, two, three. In these two smaller pots, I'm going to put in that uh, red, not red, the raspberry tomato that I was telling you guys about. I'm actually going to put in, I think, two maybe three seeds maybe i'll do it two just just because i saved these myself and it was my first time ever seed saving tomato seeds i have no idea if i did it correctly i have no idea if these are going to germinate or not um this is actually kind of nice it's like a nice way to get the seeds out of this little soy sauce packet one two three four perfect okay cool um so yeah i have no idea if these were saved properly they were saved probably I don't know, two months ago, three months ago, but it's my first time planting them. So we will see if they work or if they don't work. I really hope they work. That would be super cool. So we have these two little tomatoes. And then in here, I'm going to plant, make like three little holes and plant two per hole of this sorrel that I was telling you guys about. I do think sorrel is popular in Europe, but I don't believe that it's popular in 
America because I remember like most people didn't know what it was when we had it back in Canada. But uh, yeah, we get six ish seeds here. One, two, three, four, five, six. Cool. Also, if you think about seeds and of course, if you have the space to grow stuff, that's that's a big thing that you need for sure. But even if you have, you know, a little patio or something like that, if you think about how many seeds you get in a packet and how much food you can grow with that, it's wild to me. Like, it's absolutely wild. Like, if I look at this packet of seeds, uh, it doesn't say how many are in here, I don't think. Uh, oh, yeah. Between 1,300 and 1,500 seeds are in this little packet, which costs it's essentially like the equivalent of one US dollar, maybe like one euro kind of thing. That is a lot of sorrel <laughs> that you can grow uh, for one euro. So anyways, let's see if it works out. I have no idea. I'm very hopeful for the sorrel because I really like sorrel and it's just like, it's a fun thing to have. So anyways, okay, that is it. That's all the seeds that I'm going to plant. If you are still here, thank you so much for sticking around. If you are someone who also is into seeds or into seed saving, please let me know down below and let's talk about it because this is something that I'm trying to learn more about and get better at this year because growing stuff from seed is a skill that I kind of, I'm not going to say I'm perfect at because of course there's so many variables and there's always more things to learn, but sort of like the basics of growing something from a seed, I can kind of figure it out. But seed saving is something that I'm very new at. Like I said, these are kind of the first seeds that I have saved. I did used to save seed save holy basil and then it stopped germinating for me for some reason and I don't have it anymore. But this is something that it's like a skill that I'm learning this year. All right, that is it. That is it. Can you see my whole face? This has been a ridiculously long video. If you are around still here watching, I thank you so much. That's wild that you care about this stuff, but it's also really cool because it means that you're probably into books and into the environment and into seeds and plants and stuff. So if we're not already friends, we should be friends. So please hit me up. Thank you so much. As always, thank you guys so much for watching, for liking, for commenting, for subscribing. It all means the world to me. And I'll see you again in the next one in a much shorter video. I really, really hope.